Yeah. So let, let me go ahead with the introduction. So my name is Bamidele Ogumaki. A, a couple of people. So here I can, I think I've recognized um, a, a different but familiar accent. And so um, it might be a bit difficult for you to pronounce my name, but there is an easy way to do it. So you could um, you could break my name into into different parts. You could break it into two and call me Bami. You could call me Dele. Um, you can break it a bit the first part and just call me Bam. A couple of my friends call me Bam. Um, I have some other people who just call me B. You know, maybe because being able to pronounce the full name might be might be tricky. And then um, I'm a cybersecurity consultant with Microsoft. Um, I work in a group called the Compromise Recovery Security Practice. Now, this format you see here for for my introduction, I stole it yesterday from a colleague of mine. And as we progress on this course, you would see what this means. That's for anyone who is not familiar with this kind of format. It's a it's a language used to query data, and um, most of what we'll be doing is based on this language being used to query data. So by the end of day two, if you don't have an understanding of this kind of geeky looking formats, it's not geeky, but you would be able to have, have that good understanding. And just like I mentioned, this is the team I work with. Um, it's a couple of us and we, we kind of do the dirty work of um, helping customers who have already been attacked, um, who have had a cyber attack. We help them recover from the compromise and not only recover from the compromise, but most importantly, we help them gain back control of the environment. So you will be seeing um, a lot of illustrations relating to um, security in itself and also how within security we actually um, look at the dark side of getting people back to have control of their environment so most of our conversations would be around around that it would be a good opportunity to to meet um, everyone um, I see we're about 20 plus people in in this meeting, let me just check again. Yeah, about 26 attendees in this meeting. So one of the things um, we try to do to capture um, who you are, your current role, without also burning so much time is there is a form. And in that form, you would be able to just put in information about who you are. Um, if you have any experience related to um, the prerequisites of joining this course, it doesn't in any way limit what we're going to do next, but it, it helps me tailor some of the conversation easier easier to you. Um, so that's one thing. So Joy, I don't know if you've been able to have the the form shared or did you receive it from me? I still can find it here. Um, okay. Or I think if you share with me on, I'll, I'll try and download it. I'm trying to access it. You said it's my personal teams, right? So, so um, let me just do something. Um, I'm going to copy the link right now again. Okay. And um, I will, I will drop it to you in in different. Yeah. So I'll drop it to you here, and then you can share with everyone. So during the course of um, of today, we would be able to have this information and, and relate better with you. That's the real objective. So um, I would be able to call you by name, um, understand what your current role is with respect to moving towards what you would like. Um, if you have any experience with Microsoft security and Microsoft solutions, so the, the very common Microsoft solutions we fall under technologies like Windows 10, Office 365, um, for those who are already taking that work into the cloud, Azure, and um, for what we're trying to do today and and next week, um, Microsoft 365 Security, where you would hear a lot of Microsoft Defender, Azure Sentinel. 
And so we'll do a couple of conversations around that um, as we progress today. So you will get the form, you will get the form in a short while. Uh, like we've mentioned, so it's today and next week, Saturday. Um, I kind of have a feeling we'll go beyond 2.30, but we'll try to make it 2.30 so we respect the time. Um, don't forget, raise your hand up, uh, break into the conversation if you have any questions. But one of the things we could do to also make the conversation more coordinated is you could use the... So in the Teams channel, there is a wiki, and in that wiki, you could just drop any questions that um, you feel might maybe derail us, but don't throw those questions away. Share the questions, share your ideas. Um, there are certain times we might have breaks where we could just discuss anything, and some of those questions will be good enough to, to address during that. Um, and then the last 15 minutes of every hour, it's good to maybe just take a break. Um, I would still be here, so the break doesn't mean it's kind of a break to allow us interact a bit more. And um, the five minutes before every hour, uh, we could just, you know, understand people might need to take bio breaks, drink some water, um, or stretch their legs, depending on on what you are doing. So I'll, I'll be looking towards that timing. And if for any reason you feel the class should just, you know, just pause, um, please let me know. Okay, um, what's the other thing with the introductions? So day one, today we're, we're, there's, it's good to land softly and, and landing softly kind of builds the frame of what we will be looking towards. Um, security itself has been changing and the major part of security that has changed is um, the landscape. Um, what that means is before, and you would have heard it a lot, when it comes to security, um, securing information, securing information assets, um, it really used to be about network security. Um, and, and so with network security, what you get is you put in controls like firewalls within organization, um, physical devices you could actually see, touch, um, physical devices you could configure and put in certain controls for allow, deny, um, devices that have the understanding of what your network is, but there used to be a missing part with that kind of um, security control. And the missing part is where we are today, and that's the identity part. So you would commonly hear that um, the perimeter of security has changed. Um, it's no more on the edges, but it's now from inside. Inside meaning who is who, being able to identify everyone. Um, a, a very simple way of talking of identity is your username and your password. Um, in the financial space, it would be your ATM card, your account number, um, your hardware token, your software token. Um, and you would see that in, in other industries, it, it's, it's the same thing. It's really about identity. It's really about who you know, what you know, and um, where security comes in is a level of access. So if you are going to be able to identify people or identify um, specific entities, then you would want to be able to put protection around those entities. And we know what identity looks like today. Um, there's no one here that doesn't have more than one email account, more than one bank account. And while you have all of that, it's still tied to you as a person. And so you start deciding, um, is this for me or is this um, something that should be shared? So identity is very key in the evolution of the security landscape. And today I would kind of show you how um, technology plays a role in that. And when I say technology plays a role, I would give specific reference to Microsoft. What are the principles we focus on to be able to give you um, protection over identity as the core? After today, um, you should have enough information to do a couple of things for you. One, um, let me call it level 100 understanding of, of the technologies that give you um, the mapping with this evolving landscape. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is 
you know, I, I'm I'm a strong believer of put your put your efforts um, into what's interesting for you, into what's relevant. And so, if you can spend two and a half hours today in this session, um, one of the things you can be doing with this after you leave is get your hands on 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 using um, what you've learned, being able to apply your learnings to wherever you are. Um, obscure yourself so you have new knowledge and most importantly be able to demonstrate that you have this new knowledge and you have this capacity and the best way to do that is by um, knowledge checks um, testing yourself and ultimately um, certifying yourself that you can use the new knowledge and this is called um, in, in Microsoft we call that rule the security operations analyst role. There is a certification exam in which when we go through this journey together, you will be able to, um, you will be prepared to, I would say, remove the anxiety of, of um, what that exam um, does for you. You are basically prepared and you have enough to be able to get you through doing the preparation of the exam. So. By, by the time we finish today, I would leave you with a couple of things, access to a demo environment where you can play around what you've learned. Um, I would also leave you with, um, you, you, you will have access, which you currently do have, you may or may not be aware, to the learning path that helps you prepare for the exam itself. And um, by next week, what we will do is with that new knowledge, you would be able to Kind of walk through that, you know, it's not really a rough day in the life of a security operations analyst, but you also need to understand that a security operations analyst kind of sits in a tension zone where um, you are responsible for detecting, you are responsible for protecting, um, and you are also responsible for responding fast enough to um, threats within an organization or within a system. And so that's why you have this um, not so smiling picture of um, someone out there, uh, kind of a, an, an army person. And, and that's that's the day of what the person goes through. It's, it's hot, it's tough. You have so much to deal with, but you still have to hold that mantra of being able to protect. So you would be able to do that um, and play that role when we have the day two, um, the day two session. We, we talked of the certification. You know, this is basically the certification. Um, it's the security operations analyst. You will be playing around with um, Azure, Sentinel, Defender, and Microsoft 365 for you to prepare for this exam. Um, and when you do get this, um, certification, you're, you're, you're going to be a certified security operations analyst. This is a fairly new exam in the certification path and um, it was released internally um, as a beta version. Um, I think it was late last year, um, but it's an interesting exam to do. Interesting because while you learn, you are able to actually put a lot of things to play. So I'm hoping we would be able to do this journey together and, and, and hope to see you get there. Um, you will have a self-paced learning guide. You would have a lot of documentation. One good thing about Microsoft documentation is it's easy to read. Um, you kind of, the, the writers put themselves in the mind of um, the people who should be reading. So it's just an easy read where you have a lot of references. So that's that's basically what day one and day two is going to be like. Um, and I would want us to jump into the interesting part of, of let's even start learning. Let's start sharing the ideas. Um, the learning part you see on the screen here is something that you will be able to, you would have access to, but we're going to touch on this um, on day one and day two. So, and you're also going to have an environment where you can play around, play around with this. So I would take a pause here. Um, I, I would like to hear from a few people. Um, so please, just before I go into the matter of the day, let me hear from you. Um, I can't see the chats, but if you can unmute yourself and have something to say.
So I'll give about five five minutes for us to do that. Um, who wants to go first? Another thing I should mention, if no one goes first, I'll just start picking people. Hello, um, family. My name is Charles. Sorry, so I'm not sure I understand, you know, what you want us to do. Okay. Do you I want agree. us to introduce ourselves or hello? Um, yes, you can introduce yourself um, and it's good for you to be here. I see you have an interesting Saturday. Um, if if we if we if we introduce ourselves, um, we may not be able to exhaust the time. So one of the things I would like anyone to do here is, if there are anything, any specifics, anything you feel is important for the class to know, um, it could be your expectations about the course, it could be um, any questions about what I had shown in the previous few slides. Um, yeah. So. Since you've spoken, let's hear from you. Okay, so um, I don't really have much to say, but I, I do expect you know to um, learn you know the at least the basics of you know um, security within you know the Azure space. I'm um, quite familiar with you know some basics of Azure. Um, basically the computing part and also a part of identity. So I see this as an opportunity to learn, you know, further and I'm very excited. Cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Fridos. Um, and just for everyone, I know Fridos. So it's good to have someone I know in this in this space. OK. Any comments from any other person? I know I would start going into random calling people out. And then once we start the session, I will switch off um, the video. So we're just focused on the content. I think I left this on for I left this on for the introduction. And I also was going to, you know, I used Minecraft. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Minecraft, but um, it's an interesting, creatively educative game, and um, it's. It's based on the need to learn science, technology, engineering, and maths, and coding also um, for kids that are coming up. So kids love this game. There's an educative part of it, and I've just recently um, started studying on how to be an education innovator. Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. Um, so we have someone's hand up. Uriel Feloa, yes, please. Okay, hi, good afternoon from Nigeria. Good yes, um, it's good to have you Bamdele, on this training session and I'm happy to be on the training session as well. So I think I'll just say what my expectations are okay. and that will be, so, okay, I work as an information security manager with one of the startups in Nigeria and I would like to understand how to use um, some features, some on Office 365 to implement certain um, security um, strategies that we have um, planned, basically. So I'm looking at, you know, how to um, create efficient awareness, efficient um, program using Microsoft 365, okay. how to, you know, go about using the Microsoft Attack Simulator and all, you know, other features available okay. on Microsoft 365. Yes, so that is one thing that I'm really looking forward to, aside, you know, other things that will definitely come on as we go through the training. So, yeah, thank you so much. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Um, we definitely will be able to touch on on um, some of what you mentioned um, for the reason being it's it's very well available as a as a feature, as a functionality. So that's cool. That's nice. Um, thank you. So um i will go into our agenda for the day 
And like I mentioned, please, it's going to be as interactive as possible. Um, stop me anywhere. And um, if you have questions, just feel free to unmute and, and we talk. So the first thing we, we really want to drive into is threat protection. Um, and, and the way Microsoft handles threat protection today is, is unified. Now, what I mean unified, um, it all starts from collecting information and then analyzing the data from that information to make um, predictable responses. And so for you to be able to achieve that, you will be using an advanced solution that does machine learning um, analytics um, that can predict behavior and can also automate responses. And that's where you start hearing um, SIEM and XDR. Now, don't mind the acronyms because in the next slide, I will just briefly, and for the sake of, I would address every, every potentially new area here from an explanatory point of view. So let's go into what um, a SIEM is or what's being called a SIEM. For those in the security field, you would know SIM to, first of all, it means the security information and event management. Um, it's kind of a system which does, which collects logs, um, security logs from devices, network, endpoints, um, applications. If, if you are familiar with any um, operating system, every operating system has a location where system logs are stored. Um, every, every operating system is required to have a location where security information is stored um, for auditing, for compliance, and most likely and most definitely also for being able to analyze threats from those security um, logs. And not just the operating system, but even applications that run on the operating system should have the capability of being able to identify, tag, um, and highlight security events or security um, logs on a device. So while you have systems that collect this information locally, um, it is required that you have that information on the system sent to another system it will just dump its information on that system and that system it dumps it to is called a SIM. So what a SIM does is any data that's being logged from a security point of view on any device, endpoint, network appliance, um, cloud uh, service is sent to a SIM. And when it's sent to the SIM, the SIM helps you, gives you insights on what's a threat, what's not a threat. Um, so things like uh, antivirus logs, um, login, login audits for security events. Somebody logged into a machine. Should this person have logged into a machine? You just want to collect all that information and be able to scan that information for what's normal and what's abnormal. And so anytime we refer to SIM, just think of SIM as a system that collects the information. The other two things that you would find coming up is uh, two terminologies. So there's the old name and there is the new name. Um, the old name is called endpoint detection and response. So if you have any solution or any system that is called an EDR solution, basically it's a solution that sits on an endpoint and it's able to detect threats and it's also able to respond to threats. Um, an example of detection and response will be um, a virus is found on a system, the antivirus blocks the virus. That's a detection. It's also kind of a prevention. But then do you want the antivirus to have the capability of doing a little bit more than detecting um, a threat on a system? For example, you want the antivirus to be able to clean the system and maybe delete the file. And so systems that have this capacity are called EDRs. But we mentioned earlier, technology is evolving and security is also evolving. And so what we've realized is having an endpoint detection and response solution is not enough because an endpoint detection and response solution sits on a device, for example. 
and because it sits on a device, it means how do you protect information that is not sitting on a device? You know, what if I'm accessing from just a web browser? What if I'm accessing from an application and it does not require a device? What if we are talking of systems that just communicates over the wire? And so we've kind of extended that functionality and that's what has evolved in the security space. That not just endpoint detection, but what you really want is an extended detection and response system. And what that gives you is, it gives you the ability to secure cloud platforms, um, on-premise platforms, that's devices and platforms, networks that sits within an environment or outside an environment. Um, you should also be able to cater for the different kinds of platforms, Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android, and even Internet of Things platforms, IoT devices that don't even have operating systems running on them. You want to be able to detect, you also want to be able to respond. And so the reason you want to do that is if we look at the sophistication of attacks that have happened in the past few years, and it happens every day. So every day you hear of a breach, every day you hear of something that has changed um, in uh, you know, data leakage from an organization. You find these things happen so much nowadays. And when we look at some of the stats, it, it's a bit scary because um, first thing you would see is corporate identities are being attacked. If you work in an organization, um, attackers are trying to get hold of your credentials, your username, your password, for example. Um, the other, and, and, and on, on every month there are at least 50,000 plus um, identities being attacked when we look at our detection tools. The crazy thing also is more than 90% of malware that's found actually evolves by itself. So if you have a malware found on one device and you have that same malware found on another device, it's a different variant. Not only is it a different variant, um, it's, it's response, it's a different behavior. And what that means is the people who actually write, um, who use malware, who attack the adversaries, one of the things they do is they also do a lot of um, machine learning and investigations on whoever they are attacking. And they try to condition what the response will be. So the malware is behaving very, very intelligently. And you are seeing malware that says, I'm scanning this, I'm scanning this system, for example, and I can't, I can't find a way to steal, these credentials I can steal from the system are useless to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step further and search for anyone who has logged on to this device and I will steal those credentials. And then I probably want to use those credentials to try to access other devices on the network if those credentials will work. And so what attackers are doing is they are putting a lot of sophistication. And if you're, um, if the, if what you are hunting is uh, faster than you, then you will be the one being hunted. And that's what's happening. They are, they, are, they are getting more sophisticated and you who has to defend yourself also has to put in a higher level of sophistication. So that's one thing that we, we have noticed. And because um, attacks are planned well ahead of time, in less than two days, um, an attacker can have control over the network because a lot of what's being used is automated. So in the past two years, okay, so let's say in the past one and a half years, something has really, really turned its heel on um, accelerating digital transformation and accelerating the way we work, um, accelerating the world today. And we're doing a lot of remote work. Right now I'm at home having this session and I can bet more than almost everybody here is not in the office. It's very different to how things would have been done a couple of years ago. Um, I actually attempted to go to the office today, but really, not really needed. And so because the world today is shifting us away from the normal way we have been working, um, we're either at home, we're either just, you know, 
working with few people together. Um, the pandemic has changed a lot in what we do and, and we're required to also be more productive while being on the internet. And so because of that, the threat landscape is also evolving. So if an attacker needed to attack you while you were behind the firewall in your office, now all the attacker needs to do is attack you while you are in the comfort of your home through your weak Wi-Fi protocol access, for example. This time around, your corporate perimeter network device is not going to be able to protect you. And that's what attackers are doing. Before they needed to crack through firewalls, now all they need is just to crack through your identity, your username, your password. If you reuse passwords, for example, you are more liable. If you use weak passwords, you are more liable. Um, if your access points have weak encryption, you are more liable. If you download malicious software, you know, and those are the levels of exposures that attackers actually use um, to, to make it a bit easier to get to you as opposed to before. Organizations are tasked with the responsibility of still keeping people protected, still keeping information protected, confidential information confidential. Um, information has to be available to whoever is required and not more than that. And so that's where what can technology do um, to help bridge that gap. And so what we've been doing um, at Microsoft is we have taken a lot of the signals that come from everywhere in the world. Um, and those signals are basically across every service Microsoft has. Um, Xbox, Hotmail, Outlook, Office 365, Azure, all the threat intel that comes from every single service is available to protect everybody who uses any of these services. And that's what we will also be showing you um, during the course of today. The reason why this is very important is because the solution to be faster than attackers is actually something that has to do with um, changing a mindset, developing a new mindset when it comes to um, when it comes to protecting yourself. And that new mindset you would hear a lot and it's called zero trust. So zero trust, as harsh as it sounds, um, basically tells you, look, you might know who this is, but you need to always verify. Don't trust based on knowledge. Treat every interaction like you need to validate the interaction. And so when you hear of things like two-factor authentication, um, one-time token. Those are things that follow the principles of zero trust to say, I know this is your account number. I know this is your card. I know you just put in your PIN, but I just need to be double sure that it's not somebody else. So I'm going to send you a one-time token to an, a phone number you had previously registered, not a phone number you just registered or you just want to impute, a phone number that ties to you, your identity. And if you can respond with that one-time token, then I've verified it is you. And so that thinking, that approach is called a zero trust approach. And why it is very important in dealing with um, the security, um, attacks we have today is because, first of all, it helps you move from assuming. Assumption is one of the is one of the killers of, of facts. If you can assume, then you would most likely probably be wrong because assumption comes from, um, I know this before, but have you been able to verify this now? So zero trust, one key principle in zero trust is moving from assumption to verification. You have to verify. The second thing is you, you, you have to adopt a policy based approach to what is called list privilege. So first of all, what's list privilege? And I will give you an illustration. Um, if you stay in a house that's got. Let's use a traditional family setting that's got the father, the mother, the kids, and they have a couple of you know, 
the house is made of the kitchen, the living room, the master bedroom, the kids room. Um, there is a balcony. If you have that kind of picture of this is my house, then first of all, every single person who is a member of that house should be known. So if, if you see somebody else who is not a member of the household in the house, you know, everyone will ask questions. If you see someone who you do not know in your house, it's not OK to walk away and say, maybe I would assume he's somebody's friend. Because the minute you start going with the first principle of assuming rather than verifying who it is, then you don't know who you are dealing with. It could be anybody. And so what you want to do is you have a policy approach of saying I would only allow members of this household to come into this house. And how do people come into the house? They have keys. So if you have keys, let's let's assume you have um, uh, three, three keys for the front door. You, you will need at every point in time to know who is owning the key. For example, who has the first key, the second key, the third key? Um, and that's the key to the front door. If you happen to invite somebody to your house, you, you're not going to be handing over your house keys to the person. You would invite the person in and you would also escort or allow the person to exit. And that's where you start saying, I would only give access to who should have access. But if nobody knows who should have access, then anybody can come into the house. Um, keys can get missing, keys can get duplicated. If nobody is monitoring it also, nobody would know exactly what would have happened in the house. So just using the principle of, you know, I have a space, I own a space, and I need to trust who I allow into the space, is where you start doing least privilege. If a carpenter comes to work, in your house, you are definitely not going to be giving, if, if he needs to work in the kitchen, you're not going to be giving access to the bedroom. In fact, if a carpenter comes to work in the kitchen and you find him in the bedroom, you would, you would, you would immediately ask the question of what are you doing here? Because there is no reason for that. And that's the principle of least privilege, only give access to where is required. But you want to be able to do it in a way that it's known, it's established and it's policy driven. So it could be as simple as letting everyone in the house know visitors shouldn't be allowed to certain parts of the house. That's it. That's kind of a house policy. Um, and so if there is a violation of that policy, it's easy to retrace the steps of how did it happen? Um, anyone who violates that policy is definitely an intruder. And that's the kind of policy based approach you would want to tackle. Um, there's somebody who wants to say something. Someone just unmuted. Um, I, don't know, I don't know who this is. Hi, Shitakira. I want to unmute you, Mama. If you can hear us, it's here. OK, so I can mute. And if anyone wants to, um, if anyone wants to unmute, they can just do the same. Probably that have an error. One second, I think there is somebody else. OK, okay. yeah, I've, I've muted her. You can go ahead. OK, thank you. Great. So. Those are the two principles. There is one more principle of zero trust, which 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 has to go into um, a different way of doing things. And that's in every system you have, you design the system with the assumption that every part of your system can be breached. Every part. Um, if you have keys to the front door, they could be duplicated. Um, if you have keys to the bedroom, um, the door could be broken. And so when people talk of layered security, that's kind of what they try to address by putting security at different layers. But now we're saying not just at different layers, but put security at every point. There has to be a form of verification because if you have one point compromised, then you will be able to have compromise happen. 
um, a, a very common trend you would see for some of the huge cyber attacks um, globally is what is called supply chain compromise. And supply chain compromise is, I have, I have a service provider offering me a service and that service provider gets compromised. And because I trust that service provider, um, I get compromised. So if, if you are familiar with the major cyber attack called non-Petia, um, where, you, where, where there was a lot of activities with um, ransomware, um, ransomware, for example, it all happened with a service provider was compromised. The same thing happened with um, SolarGate, SolarWinds, where SolarWinds as a service provider, the code they had was compromised and every, every um, customer of theirs was vulnerable. And so what that tells you is the ability to secure at every point is very important from, from your software, how you build your software, um, to how you exchange information, to how you validate identities. You know, attackers really just try every possible means by looking through vulnerabilities. And so once you adopt that mindset of zero trust, you are automatically going to be catering for your identities, like your credentials, your devices, your data, the infrastructure your, your data sits on, the applications being used, and the network it all rides on. The zero trust approach should be applied at different levels in here. Because when you want to apply them at different levels, you will be able to tell where a breach is about to occur, or you would be able to detect faster um, and respond faster. So what we have done over the years in Microsoft is um, with with recently and and it's been it's yeah, been a combination of efforts over the years. What's it called? Episode is yes, but... okay. Another person muted. Okay. Omolara, we can hear you. Okay, cool. She's muted. So that was an error. Okay. So let me just go back here. And so what you want to do is you want to be able to protect all of this. You want to be able to ensure that at different levels of, you know, how do you validate your devices? Are your devices? Do they have the right software? Um, are they patched with the right um, level of updates? Um, do they have the right level of protection from endpoints? Your identities, what do you do with um, additional verifications like two-factor or multi-factor authentication? For your data, what kind of policies do you put around um, preventing data leakage by protecting the information? Um, if, 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 you, if you send, a, a very good example is in this meeting. Hello? Okay. So a very good example is in this meeting, um, you have invites sent to attendees. It means there is somebody responsible for deciding who gets invited, and there's somebody responsible for identifying any of those people. The reason is you wouldn't want information that shouldn't be going out to be going out, for example. Um, the same applies to your infrastructure, where, where your devices reside, um, the core of what builds um, where your application sits, for example, you want to be able to put in this thinking and this approach of not just trusting because you know, but being able to verify at every point in time. And so that's what the zero trust principle actually helps us to achieve. So we talked of SIM, we talked of XDR, and so we have brought in two major solutions and they don't stand alone um, that gives you a full set of prevention and protection in them and all of this cuts across different clouds so you could have um, your workloads in different cloud platforms like Google, AWS, Azure but you have one place where you can collect, remember the same is basically collecting security information. You can collect security information from all those sources and you throw them into Sentinel. 
and Sentinel does analytics on that and you are able to read through the information and decide what's malicious, what's harmful, um, and what should be protected. That's with the part of bringing in information into a sim. But how about the engines themselves that help you protect um, what we just looked at from your identities, your applications, your networks, and we're able to get that with the same Azure Sentinel with Microsoft 365 Defender. Because what that does for you is with 365 Defender, you are able to cut across, and I will show you the exterior suit, across identities, devices, data. This is one solution that basically covers all of these areas. And that's why it moved from being an endpoint detection solution to being um, an extended uh, detection and response solution. Now, what are those individual technologies and solutions behind Defender XDR? You may or may not be familiar with some of them, but, but this, is, this is what makes them. Um, one second. You have a part that deals with just identities. It's called Defender for Identities. You have a part that deals with endpoints. It's called Defender for Endpoints. Um, you have a part that deals with email, which is Defender for Office 365. Email and documents, that's your office space. You do have a cloud app security solution also that helps you take a look at um, cloud applications. And you have Defender being able to also protect and monitor um, applications. All this in a suit that gives you the ability to send data also to Sentinel and being able to use Sentinel, for example, to prune through um, the data. And that's in, 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 in helping you to stay I would say stay protected. These are the areas where you would be focusing on all these areas for protection, all these areas for detection. Um, over the course of today, I would spin up a demo tenant and we will start seeing some of these things in action. We will be able to see how you can first of all understand the technologies. Um, and when you understand the technologies, you would be able to understand how the technologies are able to keep you protected because that's that's really the um, the core of what you need to do. Understanding which technologies can give you the knowledge and the level of protection for what you do, and so we would jump into that in um, a few minutes. But just like we discussed, as we jump into that, one of the things I would I would want to hear from you for example, is I would want to hear how familiar you are with all the solutions. You have the names right in front. If it comes to identities, it's this. It had the former name and now this is the current name. Um, so for identity, for endpoints, for cloud applications, and for user data. These are some of the things you will have to be getting a bit familiar with as we progress. But um, you shouldn't be worried about that because we're, we're, we're going through this journey together. So let me, this is our 15 minutes of, um, let's open the floor, let's talk, and um, let me take any questions that you might also have. Hello, you there? Hello, ladies. Um, you, if you want to ask your questions, please ask your questions now. Do you have any questions, Oluchi? All right, follow up. Please go ahead. Be a quiet, quiet. 
All right, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Vamindele. So um, I have a question, which is, um, does the Microsoft 365 Defender come as a separate package for, so in an organization where you already use, you know, Microsoft um, Office 365 as your, you know, communication and collaboration tools. So does the Defender also come with that or is it a separate, separate um, solution that has to be, you know, um, bought and then implemented in the um, organization? Okay. So that's my question. Okay, I get the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I get the question. So, um, th this touches on licensing, and, and what happens with licensing is there is a suite of products that have Defender included in them, and then there is also the option, and, and I think that has always happened over time. There is always the option of um, having these solutions individually. So it's a suit called 365 Defender. Within that suit, you have four main um, solutions. One is Defender for Identity. It used to be called Azure Advanced Threat Protection, and it's a separate solution. Um, this identity solution is mapped to this technology that handles identity. And so um, for anyone who is familiar with the Microsoft solution for identity is Active Directory. So what you have is you have a solution that handles the identities store, which is Active Directory. That's one. Um, the other one is Defender for Endpoints, which is also a license that can be purchased separately or it's part of a suit. Um, so in the suits, for example, you will hear things like um, Microsoft 365, E3, E5. Uh, but what you hear with a lot of this is endpoint is that equivalent of I have a device and I have what used to be an antivirus on the device. So it's an endpoint solution. That's one. Um, another solution is cloud apps application security. Interestingly, you don't purchase this separately. It's just bundled once you have um, a Microsoft 365 E3 license, for example. It's, it's part of it, it's bundled with it. You don't necessarily need to purchase it, but it comes as part of the features and it's, it's cloud app security. It helps you look at the data within your environment and look at the cloud um, discovery information of that data. So. If you are using an application like um, X application, it can give you a risk score of the application and it can also detect if there is information leakage, um, if there are security threats to using the application, for example. And the last, which, which, which really started the journey of threat protection um, is Office 365. And Office 365 is not just the email component, but Office 365 is the email, the OneDrive, OneNote, um, PowerPoints, um, Excel. Everything that has to do with productivity sits within Office 365. And so having Defender for Office 365 is having an additional layer of security for Defender that goes over Office 365. The reason why it's also focused as 365 Defender is because it's additional to what is existing. It's the security suits for um, the security suits for your Microsoft solutions. And so you can have customers that just have Microsoft 365 and they don't have Defender. But then Defender is the security layer on top of your um, existing investment. I, I hope that answers um, or you tell me, th does it answer in any way? OK, thank you for your response. Right. So one thing I picked is um, to to have the uh, Microsoft 365 Defender. I have to be sure of the license that my organization has for Microsoft 365. Is that what oh, yes. is that what you? Okay, yes, okay. You, you really okay, because what you have, you, you know, because in some cases, and we see it happen where customers actually have this already. 
um, but they don't use it. So they have this level of protection, but they are not so aware of what they have. Maybe there is, they've, they've, in some cases, some, some are actually going to make investments in looking for the same level of protection without knowing what they have. Mm-hmm. In other cases, it's really about the approach of having a built-in security um, approach rather than a bolted-on approach. So a bolted-on approach is where you have you have a solution and you have to purchase another solution to protect that solution. Um, interestingly, in the security space, a lot of people have defined wrongly what defense in depth means by you know having different security solutions. But what you want to do with any security solution is you also need to check if you are not duplicating the efforts across um, in, in the organization. Okay, okay, yes. Um, thank you for that. So um, for the licensing now, which licenses have this 365 and then which one doesn't? So for licensing, um, you have M365, uh, there is the there is the E3, there is the E5, and then mm-hmm. when you have the E5, it already comes with 365 Defender. Okay. Does E3 have the 365 Defender? E3 doesn't have E365. Uh, it doesn't have 365 Defender. However, it does have. Um, E3 has identities. E3 has cloud apps. Okay. Yeah but it doesn't have the entire Defender suite. And okay. that's where you might find, um, you know, th- there is there's a very clever way of looking at the license footprints and seeing where the gap is. And okay. being able to say, you know, let's just close the gap. Um, that does happen. Okay, okay, okay. Thank yeah. you. So please, where does the Microsoft Attack Simulator, where does it sit? In okay, this so, um, domain security, so you have you have the attack simulator sitting in um, Defender for Office 365, and you also have it sitting in Defender for Endpoints. Oh. And but but the way it's done right now is this used to be different solutions and different portals. And what we've been doing in the past few months is unifying this view, and okay. so you would see later that we will just have one landing page and within that landing page you are going to have identity information, endpoint information, um, user information and within that part you can do attack simulations across different platforms. So okay. the and there are very very good tutorials on, on that. So I'm, I'm taking a note. It's one of the exercises we can play with okay. when we go into um, getting our hands dirty. Okay, but then it doesn't exist currently, but it's something that will be available later on, like having a single sign-on for this cross-domain security. It does exist. It exists right now. Oh, it does. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. It exists. Okay. This is this. What you see here is today. Um, what you have today. Okay. Okay. All right then. So I'll just I'll just confirm which license I have in house, and then I'll know how to go about it. Yes. Thank so you it, very much. It's currently, for, for Microsoft 365, it's currently one portal that has all of them within it. Um, okay. And so this is the URL. We're doing a, a first redirection because over the past few months, we've, we've made the individual portals available while the centralized portal is available. But okay. now um, there, is a, there is a due date for when regardless of any of the portals you are familiar with, you need to go into, it takes you to this centralized portal. So if you're a customer that has M365, but you don't have all the Defender products, when you mm-hmm. log into the portal, you would only be able to see the Defender um, protections that you have, for example, even though it's a single portal. Um, you upscale it and it expands the, the capability of that of that mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. Cool. Can I just make a make an observation as well? <laughs> Tell me. I, th- I think my security eyes won't just let me pass. So I can see the URLs and I can see that they are HTTP and not HTTPS. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's good. It's good. Um, it will redirect you easily. 
Okay. They, okay. they are not. They are not. Um, they are not every direct, and this is just to allow for. You go in. You could even just go in with the name, and then it automatically redirects you. So please feel free try it out. Um, okay. You will not be surprised. All right. Thank you very much, Bandi. You are welcome. So now that that brings me to a question for you. Um, and what's your confidence level or your, you know, within the Microsoft space, what solutions do you really, really handle? Okay, um, so the way my role is, so I don't work with the tools directly, but I okay. sort of can, I can do it, but it's not my role per se to do that. Right. So what I just do is to ensure that the policies and the, um, yeah, the policies that are stated in the organization to follow are properly implemented on the Microsoft tools that we have. Okay. So okay. I, I, yeah, information security manager. So I come from the ISO perspective into Compli Microsoft, yeah, compliance into Microsoft. That's what I do. Yes. Oh. So, but now I'm trying to like really get my hands into Microsoft because that is what my organization you know, uses so to be able to implement these policies better and ensure that the loopholes are properly covered, not just stated in policy. Basically. Okay, does make sense. Makes a lot yeah. of sense. Um, the within this space, there there is so much for you because you okay. are able to um, you are able to use the tools to tell your security posture. Are you familiar with Secure Score? Secure score? No, I'm not. Perfect. So we'll get into that. All right, that's fine. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, any, any, anything yeah. from a person? Okay. So, so let me let me give you, and and this is for those who, um, let's let's have a look at what the technology itself gives you. And then we would, once we do that, we can then start, um, I would want to show you, you know, there's, there's a tenant you will have access to later on and you can start trying different things. So, um, let me give you, and this is where we actually start walking through some of what we want to achieve with, um, some of what we want to achieve with preparing you for the certification itself because the certification talks it's it measures you on different things i showed this earlier it does measure you on the ability to use microsoft 365 defender it measures you on the ability to use azure defender to mitigate threats and then using the same solution um, which is azure sentinel and so it's important for you to say, so what's behind what's behind um, these solutions? One of the most comprehensive solutions is Defender for Endpoints. And we're going to start from Defender for Endpoints because you need to know what it does and you need to know how it can protect you. We move from Endpoints and then we head over to the 365 Defender itself, which then includes endpoints, identities, cloud app security, um, and Office 365. So we're going to start from the endpoint piece. And let me just Excuse give you. Me. Yes, please. Uh, there's something that I didn't get it. Maybe my network was was off at the time. Okay. Are we working towards doing that certification or you, you're taking us through then at the end of it, uh, one may decide to pursue further into the certification. Okay. Um, let me say something about the certification. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier. So you have the choice of learning and um, certifying yourself because you know, sometimes you don't want to leave that learning just on the table. You, you want to, the more you practice it, the more you want to stand out with being, having that capacity. And so what I did was um, for this masterclass, you need to have 
at least the basic understanding before you walk the path of even trying to get the certification. And so what you would learn is you would learn what's behind the technologies. You would also access there is a learning path. It's publicly available. Um, I'm expecting that by the time we finish with today, where you have the basics, you will start the learning path on your own by your own pace. And when we're having the second session, we would continue the learning, but you would have had some information and some knowledge from today. You would have had additional knowledge from uh, doing the learning path. And you don't necessarily need to certify if you do the learning path, but what the learning path gives you is it helps you understand the technologies and how to play in that role. And the reason why that's very important is um, who is a security operations analyst? Um, that role is being transformed today because that SOC analyst is the person that sees everything firsthand and the person that understands the threats to an organization and still will be able to respond. So if you go through the learning path, we've tailored our learning path against the way to actually manage the solution. If you go through that learning path, you will be able to be in a, in, in a with the capacity of I am able to investigate, respond to and hunt for threats using any of these solutions, which is Sentinel, Defender, um, Azure Defender or, Azure, um, or Microsoft 365 Defender. But not just that, even if you are not a Microsoft um, inclined person, what this does is if you have the solutions in your environment, um, you are able to use the solutions the right way. And that's what that does for you. Um, in, my, in my everyday life, what we do is for customers that's, you know, remember at the beginning I said, we, we, we work with customers who have already been compromised. Um, so it's not, oh, you need to be secure. It's a case of we, we need to bring you back to your normal operations. One of the first things we do when we get into the environment is we deploy this, these tools in the environment because these tools give us an end-to-end -end view of the current threats, the previous threats, and a way to monitor our security posture when we leave. And so what I want to pass on to you is First, the field experience of being able to be within um, an environment that needs to be protected from a cyber attack or an environment which is on the verge of being compromised, but you are able to have the insights for it. Um, and you can, it will be an amazing thing if you go ahead and certify, but the learning you get is going to be helpful for you to do that certification path. Once you start going through the learning guide, there's a lot that you already have an understanding of and um, and it does help help you. Hello? Um, can everyone still hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I can, Bambi. Okay, great, great. I, I thought I lost your voice. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so let's go into... Let's start with Defender for Endpoints and, and what it really, really does. the second cool so <clears throat> what does it mean really to let's say protect endpoints uh, and endpoints here we don't just mean desktops or laptops uh, remember endpoints we're talking of anything that can access company resource um, it could be a Linux box, an iOS device, an Apple, uh, a Mac, a Windows. Um, it could be anything. 
what does it really take to protect these devices? It comes from the combination of efforts of different teams. And so I would show you kind of, you know, a standard security persona in an organization and how all of them play a role in being able to protect endpoints. So first, you could have, now this doesn't necessarily mean this is what's your organization or what an ideal organization, um, you know, Apple for Apple is like. But if you look at the functions of each person in the information security organization, you are definitely going to have the IT people who handle, um, you know, configuration of devices, onboarding of devices. So let's look at the IT admin person as, in some cases, is the desktop team, um, the, the team that handles deployment of software or patches, the team that handles um, rolling out new operating systems. And then you have the security administrator. That's the person who is responsible for running assessments, um, defining the policies that should be able to protect the organization because you need to have policies to enforce controls. The person has a view of the actual security configuration that's required and what should be done about that security configuration if there is a deviation. Then there's going to be another team for security operations. Yeah. Sorry, does someone have a question? Okay, maybe not. Then you're going to have the security operations team or the person who handles security operations. And that's where we're going to today. We're moving away from, we're, we're, bring, we're enhancing the role of somebody who handles security operations because those are the first responders. Those are the people who um, analyze forensic those are the people who look at threat intelligence from global sources and see if some of those threats intel match what is in the organization. For example, if you hear um, there has been, if, if, there is, if there is a service provider, an internet service provider that's allowing malicious traffic to go through their network, if you have that service, if you have anybody in your organization connected through that service provider, you should be able to get insights that somebody is connecting to your organization, a staff with its identity, or is connecting through a service provider that has been seen as having malicious, allowing malicious traffic on their network. And that information does not come from in the organization. It comes from global threat intelligence out there. And so with all the signals that we put together, we make threat intelligence information available to all the services so that you can easily make decisions on how to improve your security posture. So if you look at each of these personas, um, just using Microsoft 365 Defender, all of these people will have a role to play. It's one tool where the IT admin has a view of patch management status, has a view of device configuration. The security admin uses the same tool to see the threat and vulnerability assessment status of all devices and um, in, in the network that have been onboarded. And the security operations person can be able to look at the incidents, the alerts, and respond to them quickly, all from one solution. And the reason for this is, you know, to deal with security is a joint effort. Um, one of the dangers you could put yourself through is dealing with security in silo by saying um, the security team doesn't engage with the domain team or the domain team doesn't engage with the um, network team. They don't share information together. You will have a lot of cases where you would have loopholes and backdoors. So it's a joint effort. And what the tool does for you is the tool gives you the visibility across all of that for different personas to be able um, to use it. So there are six main features and components that Defender for Endpoints gives you. It is an agent on a device, on an endpoint, 
but that agent has the ability to do the standard detection and protection. But not only that, that agent also has the ability to receive what is called response playbooks. And response playbooks are the things that after machine has learned certain behaviors, it can send a trigger for your agent to behave in a certain way. I have seen an IP address that is malicious in Russia, for, from Russia, for example. That signal will be sent to the endpoint so that if there is in the future any kind of communication um, with that IP address, then the agents will be able to say, what action did you prepare for me? The action was block the communication. And so it's the ability to do all of these things that fits into one solution. So let's look at the problems each of these components address. Threat and vulnerability management. It does address one problem. And the problem is it addresses the lack of communication between the security and IT teams. Um, more often times than, than not, you hear, we, we need to do a vulnerability scan. And that requires, um, you know, using a tool, sending data to um, systems. Sometimes it clogs the networks. Sometimes it affects certain processes. Sometimes devices are not online and devices are offline. And so you can't get real data. And so that process of being able to see the threat and vulnerability of the endpoints in your organization now becomes a very difficult task because there is no single view that can give you real time information that, well, with Defender for endpoints, you have that ability today because what it does is the same agent or the sensor which sits in. Um, which sits on the endpoints, does real-time discovery information. So the agent is collecting information about the system to understand what software is running on, on these devices. Um, what and, and within the software stack, are this software, you know, at the end of life, are they up to date? Um, do they have uh, known vulnerabilities? All that information, it takes the information and it's able to give you on a dashboard your threat and vulnerability management um, information. And not only is it able to track this kind of information, you have a way to easily remediate it. You know, the remediation also comes from single agents. So you have a service that looks at this data, tells you the devices that are exposed, and you have a remediation plan that could automatically remediate those devices kind of makes it easier for you to maintain compliance just because you have a view and you have that visibility. So you are going to be able to see vulnerable applications and configurations in a dashboard. You are going to be able to see a lot of context about it. So where is this intelligence coming from? Um, is it disclosed vulnerability? Is it um, from a breach that happened recently from that software? And then you are also going to be able to make plans to remediate any of these vulnerabilities that are found. All of this without having to run vulnerability scans every month or every few weeks. It's just real time information. As long as the devices are communicating, you have this kind of information available on the dashboard. The beauty about this also is um, it gives you a score. So the question is, how do you measure your exposure? How exposed are devices in your environment? It's able to give you the score based on vulnerabilities that have been found and threats that have been found. And over time, while you work on improving, you can see your score increase. You can set compliance targets of we need to be at 80%. What do we need to be above 80%? Well, you could go through the vulnerable software and look at how you could either eliminate vulnerable software, patch vulnerable software, um, make changes on the vulnerable software configurations that were found. You know, all of this without actually touching the system. You just have this on a dashboard and it gives you recommendations. So, 
in each of the recommendations, you know clearly what needs to be done. Um, and you can have that recommendation applied on the affected software. The reporting functionality is also very rich, so um, it's easy for you to you know, pull out the data you need and look at the devices that might be impacted or not. And, and this, this is for those environments where they are too scared to make changes because they don't know what the impact is. So you have a view of being able to measure the impact and plan for those changes in that, in that, kind, of, um, in that kind of view. So that's one thing from just threat and vulnerability management. There is another feature which is called attack surface reduction. Now, this addresses another common problem. Um, there is a growing risk that's happening globally and it's called um, living off the land malware or living off the land binaries. And what this means is you would find a malware that would attack a well-known process on a device and inject code into that process. So regular antivirus engines would look and say, um, the process is a known process, so I'm allowing the process. I'm, I'm allowing uh, MMS, SMS.exe, for example. But what happens when that process is compromised? And what happens when a malicious or an adversary has injected a malicious code into that process or into that, um, into that service? Because the devices have a log view. All the security logs, remember, are able to, um, all the security logs are being deposited and being analyzed. And so what happens is, you can see the change in behavior and you can eliminate any behavior that is not expected. And the feature that does that is called attack surface reduction. It looks through applications and the normal behavior of applications. And if there is a deviation in that normal behavior, you have a configuration that can stop that from happening. That's one. Um, the other thing is you can customize what is allowed and what's not allowed. So you could have the finance team and what they do is um, they use an Excel file and the Excel file runs macros. And running a process within a process is something that attackers have been trying. They, they, they've, they've been able to ride on that. So yes, you have them running macros within Excel, but when an attacker wants to attack that system, he would use that very well-known process of macros in Excel. And then you would see cases where applications have been compromised. So what happens is you have a glance of the devices and the attack surface on those devices. You are able to see the applications and what it has found because you can have this in what is called an audit mode. You're just looking at it and saying, you know what, I'm seeing funny things happening and I'm investigating them. And as soon as I verify this should not be happening, I just change the policy to say block this behavior across the whole organization. And if there's any business unit or any individual that requires that, you can make exceptions for that. But you first want to be able to block configurations that expose or increase your attack surface. And that's why we call it reducing the attack surface. What can be, what can be um, targeted is smaller right now. Now, attack surface reduction does this in very different ways. Um, don't, get too, don't get too bogged down by the technical terms, but let me just, let's just explain what this means. If there are sites that have been tagged as untrusted, you just have a simple policy to say block untrusted sites. If there are office files that you know um, are untrusted, like the, the conversation of what we had macros, you could decide to only allow that certain behavior by certain systems. For host intrusion, what that does is on the hardware level, 
not just the software and the applications on the hardware level you are able to run what is it the, 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 it's able to run code integrity to say i'm looking to make sure there is nothing changing on the hardware that allows malware or malicious activity to come in and so attack service reduction has all these features that's cut around these different categories and they give you specific protection for those. The good thing about the task surface reduction is, like I mentioned earlier, you can have it in audit mode so you can start planning how you enforce those controls and you are able to see if there are devices that um, match the baseline or not. Because all you need is just to create a baseline that says, I want to allow this and I want to block this and you are able to apply attack surface reduction um, rules, for example. I will go into another feature. So the other feature is, the other feature is, is basically what you see as, um, is, is basically what you see as the traditional antivirus but it's not called the traditional antivirus anymore. It's called um, next generation protection. Let me just move there. Yeah, next generation protection. Now, what does next generation protection address for you? We just talked of leave off the land binaries. We talked of cases where you could download a software and that software has malicious code in it, or that software has a communication to what is called command and control. Um, command and control is where there is communication to another server outside your organization, and it's basically telling your machine what to do. Um, one of the things you could be telling your machine to do is, I want you to copy files from this location and send it to this location on the internet, and that's data exfiltration. Um, you could have cases where command and control is basically running, copying files to your system, sending commands, and it's just waiting for one day to detonate. And that's what you have with a lot of ransomware like WannaCry, where it could have been sitting on a device for a month. And all it's needed is the command and control server would send a signal to say, okay, it's time to act. And that's where everything starts going wrong. So whatever you are facing at that point in time was not ready just now. It had been ready since. And so you have next generation protection that kind of does a little bit more than what your traditional antivirus would do. And in being able to protect, it does what is called behavior-based protection. Um, meaning I'm not just protecting because I see something um, malicious, but I'm protecting because the behavior is abnormal. This behavior is not something that is expected from an application. And so I'm going to take an action. And these are not defined. It's not, it's not a behavior that you've told, you know, before firewalls you do things like allow traffic from this IP address to that IP address over these ports. Um, antivirus engines would do um, scan these drives but exclude these executables. So don't scan these executables. And so what next gen protection does is it looks for strange behavior, even for things that you have said, I want to allow. Once there is a strange behavior, it tackles it. Um, malware today, a lot of malware today, in fact, most malware today are fileless malware. They're malware that don't even have a single file that is um, doing anything on your system. What it does is it uses command line parameters and it uses existing processes and it gets information and after then it starts acting exactly how it wants to act. Um, either command and control, data exfiltration. And so next gen protection gives you the ability. Now, how does this work? There are two components of the agent in 
um, defender for endpoints. The first part is what you have on the device, the client side. So take it that you just have a new computer, you have Windows Defender on the computer, um, and you are not connected to the internet. If you plug in a USB that has a malicious file that is already known by the antivirus engine, it will block it, it will take care of it and block it. And it does the most common malware blocking in the, in the, that it has. As long as the agent is updated to understand the malicious file, it blocks it. But then what happens next, assuming you were online? The capability of what you have next is, every time the client um, endpoint is processing any information, it sends the information to be analyzed in the cloud. Now, the cloud is where you have insights into real updated threats. And so, in the cloud, you can do a couple of things. First thing, the cloud analyzes the data to see if there is anything suspicious based on the tons of information we have on suspicious behavior. That's one. The second thing is, if it finds anything suspicious, it sends a signal immediately and the client on the device receives that signal and takes an action. And then another thing it does is, how does it do a lot of these checks? Um, if you're familiar with what is called a sandbox environment, a sandbox environment is, I'm going to take this and I'm going to try it out in a place that is isolated from the place that's affected. So you have something strange on a device and I have a copy of it I also don't want to be affected, so I'm going to drop that copy in an isolated environment. I'm going to run every possible test, and whichever result I get from that, I will send a signal back to the agent to be like, it's clean, it's malicious, or it's not malicious. And that's how next-gen protection protects you, because it really uses the signals of what is happening out there in the cloud and making sure that all the clients that have connection have the same level of protection from them and you are able to immediately have protection information that addresses what you see as a concern so in this uh, case for example you have someone who has opened up a file and they've opened up a file that needs to be downloaded and you know they probably don't know so what they do is they try to open it up and your virus protection, your virus threat protection comes up and is able to help you take an action on that file. And it does this because first, at the first instance, it may not understand the contents of the file. It may not understand. And if it doesn't understand the contents of the file and you are still trying to access it, it needs to quickly protect you. In this situation, if you look at what this file does and we scan through the process of what it does, you would see it's even making connections outside. And, and it was just a file download. All you did was I just opened up a file. And at the background, the file is doing so many things. The file is going all the way and trying to connect with um, other uh, malicious stuff. But while it's doing that, Defender has taken that information, analyzed it and said, you know what, there's something wrong here. And it immediately sends that data back to the agent and starts remediating immediately. It starts cleaning the files that shouldn't, um, that are malicious, and it shows you the details of what has been done. So you are able to see what was blocked, why it was blocked, um, it was suspicious behavior, the type of behavior. All this information was not available to the AV at the point where the file was downloaded. It was only available once you had picked it, the, the file had landed on the device, the client had picked up and started scanning, and immediately he picked up and started scanning, he sent the details to the um, cloud components. The cloud components ran its scan and came back with there's something wrong, and he just sends the signal back. In the next few slides, you would see how just one device, which is protected, 
allows you to protect other devices. So you, you find something malicious on one device and then this can go ahead and um, and protect other devices. And so that brings us to the next functionality of um, of um, Defender for Endpoints, which is the EDR functionality. Remember, we're not calling this XDR here because we're talking of Defender for Endpoints. If we're talking of Microsoft 365, which spans more than endpoints, then we'll be talking of XDR. But as long as we're talking of Defender for Endpoints as a solution, then what we want to be able to do is endpoint detection and response. So um, as long as something either originates from an endpoint or finds its way to an endpoint, you not only want to be able to detect it, but you want to be able to respond to it. So it solves the problem of what we call multi-stage attacks, where you have an attack from email and it's affecting a device or it's stealing the identity and you are not able to piece it all together. With Defender for Endpoints, even if you have a malicious behavior that started from email, you are able to detect it in Defender for Endpoints and it will show you the timeline of where it originated from. Now, if you have M365 Defender as a suit, your timeline will include M365 email, identity, anywhere that malicious activity had actually touched on. You will find it in the timeline and you are also able to respond to it easily in that same timeline. And so what it does is it correlates all the events. It just brings all the events together. And when it brings all the events, it now starts doing what we saw in the previous feature. And what it does is the function in the endpoint is called um, OS recording, operating system recording. The sensor has a record of the activities. It sends the data to the cloud version for machine learning. The cloud version sends back info to tell you this device is vulnerable. And because it is a service, it's a tenant, now that it has new detection that makes it vulnerable for one device, the next thing it does is across the entire tenant, every device that has the same behavior that was found would receive the same remediation. And that's how it does its detection and response from one system to all other systems. So it's, it has seen something funny on one system. It has remediated it, but then because the logs exist, it's able to say, I find this same behavior on 15 other systems in the organization. And because I found it on 15 other systems in the organization, I'm going to apply the fix to the 15 systems because they are vulnerable. Now for systems that are not vulnerable, they already have this baseline level of protection. So if for any reason they become vulnerable, they have the protection. And if for any reason, it even stops them sometimes from being vulnerable because of that protection, depending on how, how we get into the system. And it does this all automatically. You, you, don't, you, you don't need to do anything for this action to take place. It's an automatic action that happens on um, the portal. Um, I know someone's mic is is uh, someone is trying to speak. I don't know if okay. let me just go. It's Martha. Um, Martha, are you trying to speak or is it an error? Okay, so let me let me continue. Cool. So the other thing you would want to um, you would be getting from 
from the defender suits is what is called auto investigation and remediation. Um, as a security operations analyst, one of the things that could overwhelm you is the amount of um, alerts that you see and you have to respond to. And so if you happen to be in an environment where there are so many weaknesses and vulnerabilities, you definitely will receive a lot of alerts. If you are also in an organization or you are dealing with a system where you've got um, you've got active attackers targeting you, then you are going to be overwhelmed with um, alerts. So one of the things that Defender does is it helps you address the problem of being overwhelmed by analyzing the alerts, aggregating alerts into incidents. So you could have five alerts, but it's just one incident because they are all related. It could be five alerts, but to one computer. And so instead of making it five alerts to deal with, you just deal with one incident that contains five alerts. And so when it starts doing what it was doing before with endpoint detection and response, it starts remediations for you. And when it does remediations for you, once the remediation is completed, like I saw a malicious file and it has removed the malicious file, what it does is it helps you to automatically close that alert that's related to that entity. So you don't need to the only reason you go back to those kind of alerts is to understand what happened with the alert. If it's to manage the incident or manage the alert, the system does that for you because the system has detected, responded, investigated, remediated. And so the only other thing that is logical is this incident or this alert has been dealt with and is closed. So the SOC analysts would only be focused on active or open alerts. And there are different reasons why alerts could be active or open. One could be the system is not online anymore. So it detected an alert, but the system is offline. You can't do anything about that. You can't view the status of the resolution or the response. So you have to investigate, definitely. Um, you have cases where you have devices that have um, that are out of support. Like you have Defender for endpoints on the device, but the system is maybe a Windows 7 computer. While it can prevent and detect, it can't remediate because it's an older operating system. So you will have to take an action, even though it has prevented, you want to remove that threat from the organization. And some of the ways you can do that is upgrade the operating system. If it's a file that came in through a USB drive, you will start focusing on how do we use USB drives in safe and more secure ways, for example. Um, and so that's how, from an auto investigation and remediation point of view, it uses response playbooks. It just detects it, investigates it, remediates it, and sends the signal back. And once that signal is sent, it closes the alerts and you don't necessarily have to do any other thing for these alerts. All you just do at that point is you can view the status of those alerts and you can understand why those alerts um, came into play. So that's the auto investigation and um, remediation feature for, for um, Defender for Endpoints. And then you have something which is an extension of your team. So for every customer that has Defender for Endpoints or M365 E5, what we're also trying to do is to close the gap of overwhelmed SOC analysts by having an extension of a team who has an eyes on your tenants, looking out for you on things that are complex to deal with and you need additional insights. Like you could see an alert and you have no clue what to do about it because 
maybe you don't even understand the impact of this alert. It could be a zero day attack. It could be something that's new. We have threat experts that help you analyze this information. And on the tenants itself, you are able to receive insights on what these alerts are. You could also reach out to the threat experts. And when you reach out to the threat experts, they are able to give you assistance on more information about how you can stay um, more protected. So they are kind of an extension of your team. They walk behind the scenes and give you context. So you would see something like um, a report that they would have shared detailing. It, it's almost like you have an investigator within your team that is giving you specific information and they share that information with you. They even share additional information on how you can detect more of those behaviors. Um, so that's that's something that you have when you have um, M365 Defender and you have the threat experts team working with you. So in, in most of our projects where we um, where we help customers regain control of the environment, even we as a team going in to to protect and gain control, we work a lot with the threat experts to give an extra set of eyes on on what's going on in um, in the environment. Yeah. So, just to um, close out on this, you know. We we talked at the beginning of this. We're looking at you know in the organization who does what. Um, more often times you see people say um, you know patch patch management should be done by the application owners or patch management should be done by the security team. No matter how the organization is um, is structured, one of the things you want to be able to do at least is define the responsibilities by giving people the capacity of what they can do in the tool. It's actually not the best, but it's better for people to know more than they should do than for people not to even know how they should be able to act. And with just one single console, every persona is able to achieve or meet um, some of these things. I think what I should have done for the sake of this meeting was I should have moved the lady here to be the CISO. Um, next time I'll do that. Okay. So, just in a nutshell, um, regardless of the responsibility, it's shared. And it's good to know what each person's responsibility is. And when you do know what each person's responsibility is, it gives you a better way to um, protect um, to be able to detect and, and easily remediate threats that are found in the environment. So this is th this is kind of an overview of Defender for Endpoint. One of the things I want to show you next is I want to show you what it looks like on the portal itself. Um, because by the end of today, I would I would want to give you access to the portal and even offline, we can have conversations on when you st when you go through the learning path and you need an environment to test a few things. You read something that you want to say, how does this look like? You have that environment available. So that's one of the reasons why the background of what the technology is, is what we've just gone through theoretically. Um, the next thing we'll go through in a few minutes is we'll set up the portal so you can even see how it looks like and um, you, you go through the learning path during the week by the time we come back over um, next weekend you know you would have a lot a bit more learning and not only that we would actually work in the portal itself so the rest of the exercise will be done doing several things on the portal so you can you know let's bring to light what what we've been awesome. so that's that's it for that bit i would say let's take a short break kind of a bio break um during that period please um the mic the mic is open 
ask the questions. Um, if there is anything that you require feedback or more focus on, please, this is this is the good time for that. Thank you very much, Ami Dele. So, ladies, you've heard it all. If you have questions for him, please do well to ask your questions now during the break. How long is this for? How long is the break, Ami Dele? Um, let me see. So, already, I know. I know we've gone. Um, we're going to go a bit, a few minutes beyond our time. So, let's say we have fifteen minutes for the break. We, we we continue after 15 minutes, um, but we've, we've gone through all the, I would say, presentation contents for today. We will just spend some time on the portal and we will close for today. Okay, thank you. So please, please keep your questions coming. He's ready to answer all your questions. Or do I call names? <laughs> if that okay. works. <laughs> okay. Hello. I think I should okay, yes, one more stuff. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Famigele. Um, I'd like to ask if I want to start in um if I want to start the in the whole um Microsoft security analyst part. So I've used the Microsoft Security Center before um I was working with Se Secure Score. And why currently like we are now moving towards getting Microsoft tools on board. We currently don't use it. But then if I want to start with the entire um, Microsoft security and um, career path, what's 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 what is the first step? What are the course materials? Um the course you mentioned, the one you presented before, yeah. are the resources. Um, readily available? Is it free if I I just want to gain the knowledge without taking the certificates just yet? Um, yeah, I just want to know the beginning. Where do I okay. start from? Okay, thank you. So, so let me show you the beginning. Um, so first, I would say this, this is the beginning because what you would do um, over two sessions is to gain familiarity. Um, to increase your comfort level with these solutions. For anyone who doesn't use them, you would have new knowledge. For anyone who uses them, it should kind of amplify your, your knowledge. So there is a self-paced online learning path, 100% free. Um, if you are like me who tries to strike a balance between self-paced learning and um, classroom learning. There are certain things I would choose classroom learning for. Um, but self-paced learning, virtual learning does something um, that classroom learning wouldn't give you, which is it allows you to learn at your pace. It allows you to learn um, with addition. You can, you can pull your learning sources from different places. So you could, you could take your learning from uh, from say videos and all. So let me show you what it looks like. Um, I just click the link and you would find it. Just give me a minute, a second. And this link I, I, I clicked for the self-paced learning takes you straight. Where is it again? Takes you straight to this page where you first of all see the name of the certification. It describes the people who should be targeting this are basically oper security operation analysts. And you know their responsibilities touch on threat management, monitoring, response, all of this. You do this exam, just one exam, and you get the certificate called the Security Operations Analyst Associates. Um, this is the learning path. So just at the bottom of this page, you would see the learning path. What Hello, sorry. Yes, please. Hello, sorry. Um, is, is, it, is it the AKA link that was highlight, highlighted at the top there? Because when I 
use that link. It took me to a Bing site. Can you drop the link in the chat for me? So that's the challenge with this chat. I, I still don't have access to the chat. Um, what I want to be able to do is, I'm going to do something just after this um, session. There is a Teams channel, and the Teams channel, I would drop, for example, this document okay. that includes all of this. I would drop it in there so you can just pick the information. But it is, um, it's going to take you here. Even if you do a search online for S Microsoft Certified Security Operations Analyst, you will get to this page. This is the name of the exam, SC200. Um, and the learning path, look, it's good. Let me show you. If after this session, and, and I expect after this session, you want to have the, the knowledge you're getting from this session is not everything you would ever need, because um, if we spend a week on this topic, you would have basic understanding. You still need hands on experience, which access to a lab will give you. You still need to test your knowledge to know if you, to validate what you have studied. And so this learning path contains all of that. It's so comprehensive. I just clicked on part one. Now, part one has 10 modules in them. Please don't be scared. Remember, at the beginning of the prerequisite says, you know, you should have a basic understanding of Microsoft 365 and intermediate understanding of Windows 10. There are situations where you would get through some of the modules pretty fast just because you have a very good understanding of Microsoft 365 or you have a good understanding of Windows 10 and you will go through it pretty fast. So if you if you go into here, for example, and we say let's start from here. Most of what we were discussing today, introducing you to Defender, um, it would be slightly familiar to you because um, you heard it the first time, but now you have the opportunity to digest it. And when you watch this, you go through this, you watch the video, it's very comprehensive. It contains what we've just talked of. And then the next thing is you can actually go through the models. We went through this earlier. It gives you a better understanding. And I want to show you the parts that tells you, you know what, let me see how well I'm doing. So let's just go to the knowledge check, for example. I use knowledge checks to test my knowledge. So you can adopt an approach of doing a knowledge check before you start the course and doing it after you've read through it. Um, it's just an approach that might work for you. But if you go through the material with just that module, you will be able to answer the question, Defender for Endpoint Agents should be deployed on all Windows 10 devices in your organization. And you'll be able to tell what the answer is just because you have gone through the module. Um, and in all of that, one of the things you will see is, let me just randomize it. I'm just going to randomize it. Threat hunting. You know, we talked of not a component. There is nothing in our discussion that mentioned cloud device management, for example. Now, I did a random for the first one because it will tell you why this is incorrect. In the module, one thing you would learn is the sensor is already in Windows 10. It's embedded. So when the question says should be deployed, and you say, you just think of it and say, oh yes, I need full protection, but this time it's specific to Windows 10. What you would see here is, it would tell you the reason why it's incorrect, and you can learn a bit better when you do this. If we had chosen this, for example, and chosen this, the same thing, you would be able to see the explanation and why you have that explanation. So the knowledge checks are good. And if you just want it for your own learning, you start from the knowledge path. 
um, there are videos. So even if you want to skim through and watch the videos, you would have a lot more information here. And then you do the knowledge check. And all the, um, the models are of that nature. Um, so you had the model for protect against threats. You could go to the next model. And it's really, really, you know, I had, not just because I, I use this, um, I, I, I work with this, but I actually had fun doing, um, going through the model and also um, preparing for the exam. It, it wasn't something that gave me anxiety, but there's a good reason for that. Having an environment you can test a lot of these things with. Um, the best environment to test with is your own environment. So in your organization, if you have these solutions while you are learning, then you, you can stay in your environment and use the learnings within your environment. It does help you um, to learn better with it. And once you do that, you might not necessarily need to um, spend as much time. So I will give you, for example, um, access to an environment and there's something I would want you to do. I would want you to say onboard a device to your environment. And you know, this this lesson tells you how you can onboard a device. I will show you on the portal also. And once you onboard, you will see what onboarding means because you can try it out in in an environment. Awesome. Thank you very much. I found the link to the website. So. Cool, cool stuff. Cool stuff. I will um you have access to the channel, right? Yes, I do. For this, yeah. So I will I will I will drop I will drop information in the in the channel and I would also be available to have conversations there on okay. on what we can do. I think between now and the next class you would you would get stuff in there. Yeah, thank you. You are welcome. Um, do we have questions from anybody else? Um, okay, while we're waiting for another question, I would like to call up um, the social, the comms team attempt for there to make a few announcements. Is that, would that be fine by you immediately? I didn't hear that, sorry. I said while we're waiting for the next question, the comms team wants to make a few announcements. Oh yeah. Uh, Can they go ahead? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. So Favor and Chigozi, over to you. Favor. Okay. Um hi guys. Yeah. Hi guys, my name hi. is Chigozi Paul. I'm a communications associate at Tech for Day. So I have a few announcements to make. First of all, thank you, Mr. Bam Dili. It has been an amazing session so far. Thank you for pointing out yourself. Thank you for not holding it's back. Thank you for honoring our invitation. We hope to do um, more things with you in future. I would love to. I would love to. All right. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. So, if during the du um, duration of this training, there's anything Mr. Bamdili said that sh struck you that you resonated with, please share on your social media using the hashtag #WTBootcamp. And while you're at it, tag us so we can we share on our social media handles. Also, if you had um, if you've had an amazing time so far, if you find this session insightful, we would be expecting you to join the next session, the follow-up session next week, Saturday, same time. We would also love that you follow us on our social media for more trainings and opportunities like this. And while you're following us, drag your friends along. Don't keep the good news to yourself. Drag your friends along so that they can be beneficiaries of the amazing um, opportunities Tech for Dev has. You could follow us on Twitter. You could follow us on. Okay, you could follow us on Twitter at Tech for Dev HQ. Follow us on IG at Tech for Dev. 
follow us um send us um follow us on linkedin at tech for dev facebook at tech for dev hq also if you can see if you can see the chat my colleague favor emmanuel just posted something that you could do to something that you could also do take you could take a snip of a class something you learned and then just share you could talk about what you've learned in the class tell us about the knowledge you've gained basically just give us a shout out on our social media handle it would really help thank you so much all right have an amazing day thank you very much you thank you so ladies, if you have any questions, keep them rolling right now. I'm getting this waiting before we go all hands on. I was going to say, is it the same Twitter that uh, <laughs> we are about? Well, well, we have people <laughs> from different countries, not just Nigeria. <laughs> I know, it's just, funny. it's just funny, but it's fine. It's fine, I understand. Um, <laughs> very soon, don't worry. Don't worry, we'll soon be able to speak very soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting one there. Okay, so let's do this. Um, let's go into. I did spin up the tenant. Um, it's a trial tenant, so anything done in the tenant is really um, for the purpose of this of this session, and so. There are, for each of the solutions in M365 Defender, first you have a tenant for M365 Defender. Um, the identity is managed by Azure Active Directory. So every username, every password is managed by Azure Active Directory. And then at some points you would also have um, an uh, office no, and as your subscription where we would play with Sentinel. Um, so that's going to come when we're when we're walking through day two. But then this is what Azure looks like. But I want to show you what Defender, how we would start setting up Defender for endpoints. Now for, for lots of you, you could you may already you could be in an environment where it's already deployed. That's fine. The deployment process is just next, next, next. The real meat is in the configuration and integrations. So just as a guide, um, let me show you something. Just as a guide, um, we are going to, we've gone through the capabilities. So we're basically going to look at what the features look like. And we'll give you the ability to even um, on board and create. So this environment is just going to be an environment that is for the purpose of this. And I think you would be able to play around in this environment for um, for a couple of, I think three months. Yeah. So first thing we will do is we're going to create the environment. Um, we will choose the data storage location. We will choose the data retention. It's normally six months, but it can be less. And then we will start working on some of the preview features that um, give you the most recent. So if we head over to this portal, securitycenter.windows.com, let me do that here. This is the portal for Microsoft's Defender for endpoints. The portal for endpoints. So we will start from here but we'll end up in M365. Um, but let's just set up our Defender for Endpoint portal. So I've just, I signed into Azure with this account for the tenant. And now I have come to, let me reduce this. And now I have come to the Defender for Endpoint portal. And this is where we need to create our environment. So um, we're going to let this finish up.
So I I was going to um I was going to do this before the session, but I was like ah let's let's do it together. So you can see that was just we didn't do anything here. I just opened up the portal step one, step two, step three, and from the very first um setup page it tells us how we can onboard devices so let me throw an open question out to the class um how many of you have devices test devices for example that you would like to onboard to this tenants so if you want to try out anything you want to try out simulated attacks if you have a virtual machine um, a test virtual machine you can onboard your test virtual machine here if you have this is a trial tenant so we can play around with that if you need to create a new virtual machine for example um, if you are familiar with using azure or, you can create a new virtual machine and onboard it to this device. So for the sake of this um, of this class, anytime you want to onboard a device, there is a local script here. We can see here there is a local script for up to 10 devices. And all you need to do is download this package. If you change the option and say maybe I go to group policy, which we won't talk much about now. You can download the package. But right now there's a local script. When you have the local script and you download the package, it's going to look like this. So I'm just going to download the package. Let me save it. Downloads. It's going to be a sorry. It's going to be a zipped file. And then with a the zipped file, we can extract it. It's a compressed file, so you extract it. To extract it, I'm just extracting it to the same location. It opens and in here you will find a batch file. If you are one of the inquisitive ones, which I expect, please anything you need to, you know, open, execute, run, try to find out what's really behind it. If you open it up, it gives you information on what's inside this script. So um, I'm just going to say open this up. So I did edit and we can see what's inside the script. Basically, it gives you a description. It's for onboarding devices. Um, and once you run this script on this device, assuming I just did a double click or run and open, this is what happens. You would see this black screen. You will read information that says, if this completes, if you press yes and this completes, the machine is going to show up on this, our Defender for Endpoint tenant. I am not onboarding this device. So I'm not running this. But I would advise and we would do it um, with other devices. We would do it when we really get our hands dirty. Um, we will go through this onboarding. If you have any devices that you want to onboard for tests, just go through this same. I will, I will tell you where you can find this. So now this is the onboarding page. Let's go back one more step and say start using Microsoft Defender for endpoints. So we just click yes and it will take us to the actual landing page for Microsoft Defender for endpoints. And it's going to look like this. Now remember I mentioned this portal is going to be automatically redirected by a certain date. That's July 6. So by July 6, we're moving to the M365 portal. So you wouldn't need to stay in this portal anymore. If you just go here, the portal is taking us to a security.microsoft.com. That's it. 
Now remember, um, I think you had mentioned this HTTP, HTTPS, it's HTTPS, so you shouldn't be worried. But then it takes you to the Microsoft 365 portal, which is what you should be getting familiar with right now. Um, this portal, this old portal, let it go. I'm just going to close it. We're not going to use it anymore. So this is what the M365 portal looks like. And there is, um, for the first time you are logging in, you are going to, I would say, it would be great for you to read through the guide that gives you a quick tour. Because what it does is it tells you what you find where. If you want to investigate, identify threats, you come over here. And what's the next thing? If you want to do hunting, we will talk about hunting in in um, in detail later. You will go through here. So these cards just basically tell you what you should be familiar with on the portal. One thing I love about I I used to be um. I used to be in the in the age of where administration of tools moved from consoles where you have to install a console on a device to web browsers. And I struggled a bit with getting familiar with web browsers, but there was a reason for that. Web browsers then the behavior of web browsers will determine your experience. So um, most times web browsers didn't have all the functionality that consoles used to have like install this console and you can manage this application or you can manage this software but today web browsers give you the most recent view of what you can manage and what web browsers do for you is you could walk around with the knowledge in your head and all you need to continue what you are doing is a web browser and you are in your world so you don't necessarily need to even you don't even need a device um, to be able to do your administration as a security analyst all you need is a web browser that gives you insight into the environment so the evolution of uh, management consoles to web browsers has been it's happened over the past 15 plus years but it's been amazing because you can do everything you want in a web browser now, why is this called Microsoft 365 Defender? And what do you see different? Um, just to give you a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, when we went to Security Center, which was just for Defender, the only information you would see here is related to Defender. You wouldn't notice because there's just normal information here. But let me do a side-by-side -side for you. Um, yeah, so this is a side by side where what happened with this. So this is a side by side on the right side is the old on the left side is the new. The first thing you will notice on the new is while you start browsing, you would see endpoints and endpoints is really talking about everything on the right side. But then you would also see email and collaboration. Email and collaboration is for the Office 365 Defender side of things. So this unified portal is having more than the old portal. So everything you could do in this old portal, you can do in here. And that's why we're going to close it. We're going to only be using the new portal. So how do we look through our configuration of Defender for endpoints. Remember the first thing we saw after the setup was how to onboard devices. If we want to go back there, we just come to the settings. You would see a tab for endpoints. We come to endpoints. And all the options that will be available for endpoints is going to load up here. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have closed that so soon, but let me show you what we'll be looking at out for. So because this is the first time we're preparing the portal, you know, we'll be a bit patient. This just takes a minute or so. 
So what we would have been looking out for there in, in the old portal, you come here to settings. And when you come to settings, you see a lot of information. You see the data retention, where it says this tenant is located in Europe. We have a data retention for 180 days, which is six months. Um, we have, um, you can configure email notifications. Um, let me see if this is ready. It's not ready. We'll do the setup here so that when this is ready, it will just reflect. Advanced features. Let's talk through the advanced features a bit. Um, automated investigation. Remember when we went through the features, automated investigation, you definitely will want this to be on because you want this to be able to deal with your alerts and resolve your alerts. So on. Live response. Live response is a feature where you actually connect to a device through this console and you are able to do further investigation um, with the device. The reason why you may or may not want to turn this on is you will decide, you know, do you want your security analyst to go into devices? It's almost as good as doing a remote desktop to a device. So based on company policies, you might be thinking, should this be allowed or not? Um, and I would explain how using role based access, you can restrict this further. So anything live response, live response is where you connect. I think I have something that I can use to show you what live response is like. Just one second. I will give you an example of live response. So when you have live response turned on, for example, what you are able to do is you are able to initiate a live response to a system. And when you initiate a live response to a system, you have a command line interface. So it also means having a good understanding of using command line parameters because it's a command line interface of what you can use. And you can do a couple of things. You can take a document from your device and you can copy and upload it into the device that you are connected with. So that's where, I say, based on the security policy of an organization, you would decide if this is something you would want. And once you copy that um, file, for example, you can retrieve the file and you can run certain parameters or certain commands that you want. So in this kind of case, maybe the, the, the security analyst is looking for additional information um, and you are able to do all of that. So that was just a quick example of what live response looks like. This is one of the other new features that says if you have device groups, any incidents that comes, you want them to group it together with the device. So I would show you what device groups looks like um, later on. Um, endpoint detection and response in block mode. You know, this is this is an amazing feature because what it really, really does for you is once it has found something malicious, even if it, what, it didn't happen at that point, if you found it through the logs, it would block those malicious activities in any form they try to operate. And it could be a valid file. It could be one of those files that have been compromised or injected. But the way it blocks it, it blocks it where across the entire organization, nobody is able to use that file because um, it has been seen as malicious. So that's one feature that comes in here. We're going to turn it on. So we're going to be turning on the features as we progress. Automatically resolve alerts. Yes, you would want this. I've seen environments where they have hundreds of alerts open. So anyone who goes into the portal, how would the person know which, which should be dealt with um, from, from a level of importance. So we're going to automatically resolve alerts. Do we want the functionality to allow or block files? Yes. Now, why should this be an option? We do have cases where a customer has another antivirus in their environment. Now remember, Defender is not an antivirus. It's um, an antivirus with 
endpoint detection and response. So one component is AV and the other component is EDR. And so it can run with the antivirus components in what is called a passive mode, meaning it's not your primary antivirus. So you could have McAfee, Trend, anything as your main antivirus. But what you want is you want a cloud delivered protection that can do detection and response for you. And so you have this functionality that says, even though my antivirus is not my primary antivirus, if I find something that needs to be allowed or blocked and the primary antivirus does not address it, I want my antivirus to wake up and address it. So it's like double protection. And that's something you want. Um, custom network indicators. Now, this is one very critical feature. Um, in we, we, we use this a lot in what we call the ABCs of um, the ABCs of recovery. And let me show you what the a ABC of recovery looks like. We call them persistent control mechanisms. Anytime you are dealing with a compromised situation, a compromised asset or a compromised environment, there are three things you need to look out for. And we call them the ABCs. One, you need to find the accounts that have been compromised especially the privileged accounts. Two, you want to find any backdoors that have been created in the environment. And those backdoors could be, you know, systems that have open access to the internet, um, systems that are unpatched, systems that are in work group environments and are, are, not, are not being managed. You want to find those backdoors because it's those backdoors that allow attackers to get in your environment. And the last thing is command and control channels. Command and control is something that has been a prevailing threat because it's easy for an attacker to control you without being there physically. And it could be happening on your mobile device, it could be happening on your work or home PC, but you want to be able to find all these persistent control mechanisms. And they are called persistent control mechanisms because if any of these things are compromised, the attacker always has access into your environment and that's not what you want so when we find the abcs we come back here and we create network indicators that says i have found some ip addresses that are command and control and i'm going to update it i will show you where we do that update so you you, you include it so that any other communication in your environment is able to have the action you apply if you say i want to block it then you block it you know, that's good. Um, tamper protection. Tamper protection is where you have um, your antivirus on the device or your endpoint on a device, and then you have malicious behavior or attackers trying to stop the antivirus. And you don't want that because the minute you stop the antivirus, you've turned off protection. So if you do enable tamper protection, if there is any activity trying to stop your antivirus, it would not only prevent it, but it would also raise an alarm. So you can look out and say, what are the processes or the behaviors that are trying to stop my antivirus? Sometimes it's even administrators trying to do it. Sometimes it's application owners. Forgetting that the minute you turn off your protection, you've just opened up the windows. So we want to be able to have that information. Now, we go now a little into integrations, and we haven't talked about Defender for Identity um, in detail. But remember, Defender for Identity is that agent that is installed on your domain controllers, which actually sits in your environment, and it's able to protect you from identity threats. So even though you have that separate solution, Defender for Identity, what you want is any information that comes from Defender for Identity, you want to share it with Defender for Endpoints. Very, very relevant. The same thing for Office 365. Any information from Office 365 threat intelligence, you want to share with Defender for Endpoints. So that way, if something happens on one side, it's reflected everywhere and you do that integration. 
Um, the other integration you will be interested in is Cloud App Security. It's it's an amazing feature because I will give you one single example of how you can do Cloud App Security. You could have applications in your environment that are not sanctioned, that are not approved, and you have people using those applications. So the first thing you do is in Cloud App Security, you are able to see how people use the applications, not what they do in the applications, but you're able to get telemetry on, like if you have someone uploading files to Dropbox and in your organization you use um, Google Drive, you would want to understand why is information being sent to Dropbox because it's organization information. And so you could set policies and say, I don't want any other file sharing application in my organization. So for Dropbox, you make it an unsanctioned application. Once you do that in Cloud App Security, what you get in Defender for Endpoints is any system that tries to use that application Defender for Endpoints will take care of blocking that application. Cloud App Security has detected it, has categorized it, and Defender for Endpoints will block it. And so a lot of organizations use this to clean up unwanted software usage in their environment. This you would want to have. Secure Score. This is the place that tells you your security posture and where you stand across your identities, your endpoints, your devices, your applications, you have something that tells you, this is my score. If you are looking for an improvement plan in improving your security posture, secure score is where you, is where you go to. Intune, so for, for anyone who maybe isn't aware, Intune is the device and application management solution um, that helps you do, when you hear BYOD, bring your own device. What's that solution that says you can bring your own device and we still protect company assets? That solution is called Microsoft Intune. So it does device management and so you are integrating it with your endpoint solution because your endpoint solution is um, taking care of, in this case, Defender for Endpoints is taking care of devices. So if you have a compliance policy that says all the devices should have this certain level of software, should not have this software, you want that information to be shared with Defender for Endpoints. All these integrations allow you to be able to have a full view of the devices and your protection level for the devices. And there is an additional feature that came up um, uh, a few months ago, which is um, the device discovery. So right now, within your environment, you can discover devices that have not been onboarded. It would be able to detect that you have 10,000 computers in your environment, 5,000 have been onboarded, but we see another 3,000 devices that have not been onboarded and you can onboard them. All you need to do is just execute the onboarding. Um, in an automated way. So now we've just enabled all the features we want, the advanced features, and you, there's one more. Remember we talked of threat experts? So if you want threat experts to work with your team, all you need to do is you do an application, you put your name, you put your email address, you submit it, and the threat experts team will not only start helping watch out for your um, for your threats, but it will also send you targeted notifications. So if there is if there is an active attack that is targeting you directly, they will be there to help you. So we're just going to save all these preferences. And this helps us configure at least the advanced features we want. When we talked of um, when we talked of custom network indicators, we will find it on the left side here with indicators. So as I clicked on indicators, there are four different categories of indicators. If you have the file hash of a device, you include the file hash. If you have an IP address that you've seen as malicious, you include the IP address. If you have a URL, and 
let me show you the example of what you can do with some of these indicators. So I have an IP address, let's say 10.10.10.10. .10 and this IP address, even while I'm creating the indicator, I can show if it exists in the environment. Okay, it doesn't exist or not. What action do I want to take on this IP address? I do next. I want to block it. I want to make sure if there is any communication to this IP address, it gets blocked and I want to be alerted by it. And so I can put my details block 10.10. .10. I can say I want the severity to be medium. I can say I want this to be um, the IP address is related to an attack category and let's say it's related to command and control um, and I can just say what's the recommended action, maybe investigate. Um, now, I, I put a description. This IP address could be an IP address that is related to, um, to malicious activity. So I just put the details. The scope, I'm going to leave this because we've not created any device groups. And once you do this, you've basically just created, no, sorry, I did something. Use an internal IP address, sorry. I will change this to, where is our guy? So I changed it to an external IP address. So. And here we have an indicator that says anytime there is communication to this IP address, trigger an alert. The details of the alerts are going to be this. And um, this is just the information. You know, and, and that's how the same thing goes for domains. You can do the same thing for a domain. You can say www. I'm just joking. Twitter.com. I'm not going to say yes, but just an example. And you can do that. Um, so that's how we do the indicator parts. Which other thing did we see in advanced features? Okay, so we just enabled those advanced features. Now, we're going to close, but before we close that, there, there's something that would be um, really good for you to do. Um, in the evaluation and tutorial tab, sorry, I don't want this old portal, so this should be ready. Yes, it's ready. So the new portal, this is the new portal. Um, let's forget about what we saw. And remember, in the new portal, we just need to come down to the settings. We need to come to endpoints. And everything that we did over there, we would find. Advanced features, all the things we turned on are here. Let me just do this everything we turned on. Remember the indicator we created? It's going to be here. Yep, and that's it. So we're in the new portal and the new portal is ready for use. Um, if we want to onboard a device, we come to the onboarding parts and for a Windows 10 device, we just download the package for a local script, which was um, what I had downloaded here earlier. So if, if you have any, the, the ask here is if you do have any device um, that you want to onboard, feel free, download the onboarding package and you know, you, you onboard the device by just running this command. And the things that we're going to be doing with onboarding devices is we're going to be doing simulations. So if you come to the evaluation and tutorials and we come to tutorials and simulations, we can actually simulate different alerts. So if we, between now and in the next few days, the ask will be onboard any devices. And if you come to the simulation and tutorials part, it's very, very simplified. The tutorials tell you exactly what you would do. You can read the walkthrough. If you want to simulate where a document drops a back door, you could just read the walkthrough here. It's going to be contained in here. You will read the walkthrough. It's quite, it's quite um, descriptive. It tells you what it needs you to do. It gives you the story around it. Um, 
and it tells you how you would like to test it. So if you pick up any device that you've onboarded, when you follow this guide here, there's a file that it gives you, a simulation file. If we do a download simulation file, you're going to see it here. Now, this is what it shows me. I tried to open the file and it gave a password. But remember, it's going to tell us the password. So in this guide, in the simulation guide, we have the password already. So if I do copy the password and I come here, it should allow me to access the file. And this is the file. Now, all the simulation files you would find are not harmful to you. So something interesting has happened. Um, it thinks, OK, this is it. Yeah, so this is the file. So this file has some very funny behavior in it, very funny behavior. But just like the guide has told us, all we need to do is enable editing. And whatever is trying to run in the file would attempt to run. And when it does attempt to run, Defender is going to, it will give you a prompt and it's going to block the file because this is the file that's embedded in it and it's a backdoor. So you, you can run through the simulations safely. Um, don't be scared because every file in here, what was done with all the simulation scripts were the engines understand the simulations are not harmful. They just simulate harmful behavior. And you have a couple of detections that you can just run through. So if you onboard any device, feel free. If you want to test the automated investigation feature, feel free. We will do that together in the next sessions, but you have the chance of also doing that um, before the next sessions. So I'm going to do something else just to prepare you for, um, for playing around in case you don't have a virtual machine that you can onboard. In the evaluation lab, I'm going to set up the lab here. And this lab allows us to do 16 devices for 12 hours each. It means if you if you if you launch these devices and you want to use these devices, you should be conversant of how much time you would use. Um, my suggestion is I would provision these devices to give 12 hours each. We have 16 of them. Anyone who needs a device um you could and we'll keep that channel open you could just request for a device and the, and the credentials of the device will be shared with you or you would actually be able to view it once you log on to the portal so another thing i'm going to do with you is um to have access to this portal i will need your email addresses so i can invite you to the portal and you can access the portal so right now i'm just going to open up the lab i'm going to accept the terms and conditions because I don't have a choice if I want to proceed. Um, and I want to, I'm, I'm, I can just exclude this. So the idea is to accept the things that we want to for setting up the lab. And this configuration is going to continue. So it should finish up sometime today. We will have 16 devices we can play with. And if you want any other device, if you have a device, feel free to come over, onboard your device by going to the endpoints tab, going to the onboarding, downloading the script, and just run the script on the device. It would show up here. You would see it here in device inventory. So what I'm going to do over the next couple of days is I will spin up um, a couple of devices so that we can receive certain alerts in this portal. I would also want you to 
onboard devices. If you're familiar with having a virtual machine, you can just onboard um, with a virtual machine on this portal. So this this view will get richer as we as we proceed, and we will then be able to navigate the actual features against data that we're collecting. So you're not going to see all this information you see here is from the demo environment. Um, and then we'll go through this with the actual devices we onboard um, um, over the course of the week and also in the next session. Yeah. I would share with you all this information in the Teams channel so you can get started on on most of the things that you want to have doing um, on this portal. But for now, I think we've gotten to we've gotten to the point where um, you have some familiarity and if you do want to get your hands dirty, two things, um, the learning path, that's one. I would say start the learning path. What you'd go, the length you go with the learning path is going to take us through um, when we start walking through some of the scenarios, device investigations, managing alerts and incidents, um, Windows 10 security enhancements, and of course, some of the most interesting things that we would get to will be even um, going as far as Sentinel um, for the next session. So that basically is um, what today is like. Ah, I didn't plug this. So that's what today is like. Um, and let me hear from you. Hello. Hi, Bami. Hi, Bami. For your presentation. I can see back. Okay. You are welcome. Um, the demo was very helpful. Um, I tried to follow, but yeah, we didn't have access, so I'll patiently wait. I would need that. the email addresses for that. I would need yeah. um, the email addresses. So maybe in the channel, what we can do is in the channel, um, drop your email addresses so I can. I, I think we, we have a list of your email addresses. So the email addresses you want to use to access this. I would invite you to the tenants, um, including the links of how you can navigate the tenants and what you can look out for. I think it would also be great if I um, I will share with you kind of a little guide on some of the things you can do within the tenants. Um, and with the and this is not trying to overwhelm you, but with the learning path, you know, the learning path. For every step you go through in the learning path, you could just jump into the portal and have a look at what it exactly looks like. Um, if you see something that talks about threat and vulnerability management, you can just come in here and look at what it is. But if you don't have data, it's just a shell you'll be seeing. So we will try to populate as much data as you need. And the best way to populate data is um, to include or onboard your devices to this tenant. So that's something that um, during the course of the week we definitely would be would be touching on that. All right, thank you very much. You are welcome. So I just added one device. I have a test machine here. It's setting up the machine, but it's setting up a Windows 10 test machine. So I would use this machine to generate a couple of alerts on this portal. Um, anyone who needs any of the 15 remaining devices, feel free. Um, you can also share devices within each other if you want to repeat the activities, because you would be able to see the device information here when um, when you access the portal once this is done. So we can also reuse devices, but just have it in mind. 12 hours, you would see where the 12 hours countdown continues. And um, all the simulations we do, you will find it in here. 
all the reporting we do, you will find it in here. Um, we would we would we would play in the same area with um, attack simulation for Office 365, um, but that's something that we would go. We can go into detail in the next session because we can do exactly the same thing where we launch simulation exercises for um, for the environment. Yeah, it's it's pretty easy to walk through it. Nothing crazy. Okay, and um, for now, that's that's it. Sorry, I took additional 30 minutes of your time, 35 minutes. 